Close your eyes and picture this. Imagine yourself in the ultimate position you want to attain. Are you a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, a researcher? And are you satisfied? For our work of Literary Mary, we chose to look at The Great Gatsby through a Marxist lens. As many of you are already familiar with the novel, The Great Gatsby is about a man of the same name who spends his life trying to attain the goals he sets for himself in his constantly ascending dreams, which essentially consume his life and get him killed. The controlling element or commodity of Gatsby society is money. This is due to the influence of the Jazz Age on the novel's authorship and the economic hardships that accompanied the end of the First World War. So the characters in The Great Gatsby can be broken up into three distinct groups or classes. The wealthiest class and group with the highest social status and power is the bourgeoisie, identified most clearly in the characters Jay Gatsby and Tom Buchanan. Both of these men are immensely wealthy, well-known, powerful, and most importantly, never satisfied. While each of these men essentially have enough money and power to control anyone around them, they constantly search for ways to prove their dominance over each other. Whether Gatsby is trying to outshine Tom and win Daisy over through ostentatious displays of wealth, luxury, and greater freedom than in her life with Tom, or whether Tom is trying to exert power over Gatsby by emphasizing his old money status as greater than Gatsby's new money status, the two are constantly trying to prove that one is better than the other, never fully satisfied even when each has attained bourgeoisie status. In The Great Gatsby, there are three main proletariats that we're going to talk about. The first is Myrtle Wilson, who is the wife of George Wilson and the lover of Tom Buchanan. As the novel progresses, we see that she's with Tom not only because of the affection he gives her, but also because of the immense wealth and bourgeoisie status he brings with him. Myrtle shows this desire to become bourgeoisie through her grandiose personality changes and costume changes compared with her personality and costume when she's with her husband, George. The second proletariat is Catherine, Myrtle's sister. She desires to be bourgeoisie so much that characters think that she's bourgeoisie before they even meet her because of possessive nature toward other people's belongings. Finally, the last proletariat is George Wilson, Myrtle's husband. He begs for the chance to fix Tom's car, because even just mingling with Tom as a member of the bourgeoisie will elevate his own personal status. However, Tom shoots him down every time, solidifying George's per, uh, proletariat status, but George continues to persevere in this attempt because he wants to become bourgeoisie so much, and even just being around Tom as a member of the bourgeoisie will make him higher in the class system. Another Marxist critical theory social status displayed in The Great Gatsby is the petty bourgeoisie, most clearly identified in the character Nick Carraway. Members of the petty bourgeoisie differ from the proletariat because they are not dependent upon members of the upper class to live. However, they differ from the bourgeoisie because they do not control any means of production or others since they lack that immense wealth and status. Nick is wealthy enough that he is not dependent upon Tom or Gatsby in order to live freely. However, since he's not really rich, he lacks the influence to exert power over other members of the proletariat. Nick finds himself constantly trying to fit in with the bourgeoisie. For example, he sometimes follows along with Gatsby's plans in order to reap the benefits of being associated with the uber wealthy, and Nick also tries to date a wealthy and famous golfer, Jordan Baker. In this process, Nick finds himself trying to become more and more like the members of the bourgeoisie he surrounds himself with, while they strive to become even more rich and powerful. A similar structure to Gatsby exists in the world of Pokemon. In this world, characters pursue their destiny in a society based on skill and fame. For those of you who don't know, Pokemon is based off of the words pocket monsters. And the society in Pokemon is based off of a person's ability to capture, train, and compete with these animal-like creatures. The show revolves around these three main characters. The first of these is Ash, who comes from a small, unremarkable town and family, and he believes that it's his destiny to become the greatest there ever was. His companion, Misty, is from a large entertainment city, and she's from a family with three famous sisters who are gym leaders, and she believes that it's her destiny to train to become more skilled in order to be on the same level as her older sisters. And the third is Brock, who's a former gym leader who believes it's his destiny to use his talent to breed and care for Pokemon throughout their world. 
these characters and the people they encounter function within a society that conforms to Marxist theory. And as the series begins, they discover the true nature of pursuing destiny within such a society. So what exactly is destiny? Destiny implies that a person is reaching for something greater than themselves, that they belong somewhere better. Much like the American dream inspired people to believe in climbing higher, the idea of destiny drove Japanese citizens in the 1990s to believe in more. This is a result of the economic collapse during the lost decades as distinct social classes began to stifle aspirations for social mobility. Pokemon contains two prime examples of the bourgeoisie. The first is Brock, who is dissatisfied in his position as a gym leader. So, as a gym leader, his success lasted only as long as he won every single match, which put him in a state of perpetual unease. And you can see that he's dissatisfied in this position as he leaves his bourgeoisie status in order to become a caretaker and breeder for the Pokemon he loves so much. The second prime example are the three sensational sisters who feel the need to, un to separate themselves from their unskilled sister Misty, who's part of the petty bourgeoisie. In order to do this, they ostentatiously perform in their gym for adoring fans across the world. More directly, they harass Misty and they call her a runt to sort of put her out of the family. They are too are gym leaders like Brock was, and so they are perpetually, perpetually living in a state of unease. And he, as you can see, they are dissatisfied in their position even at the top of the pyramid. The primary example of proletariat in Pokemon Indigo League is Ash, who is a total novice just starting out on his Pokemon adventures. His lack of skill and fame define him as a character and leave him open for harassment by the other characters. Misty, for example, who is a part of the petty bourgeoisie, point constantly points out his inexperience as he's trying to catch different Pokemon. Gary, who he considers his nemesis, also calls him a loser several times throughout the beginning of the series and literally pushes him to the ground. This shows the power that the bourgeoisie have over the proletariat. Still, Ash believes that it's his destiny to be the very best, and so he challenges gym leaders in order to climb this social ladder. As Stormy mentioned before, Misty and Gary are both part of the petty bourgeoisie. Gary is, a sem is from a semi-prestigious family in Ash's hometown. His grandfather is a respected professor, which gives him a shoe into the bourgeoisie class, but because he hasn't acquired enough skill and fame, he is not a full member of the bourgeoisie class, leaving him as a petty bourgeoisie. Also, as Stormy mentioned before, in order to make sure that he is above the proletariat class, he verbally and physically attacks Ash, who is a proletarian, so to distance himself from that class. Another example is Misty, who is from a respected family of gym leaders, as we mentioned before, the Sensational Sisters. Because she doesn't have enough, as much skill as her sisters, she can't attain full bourgeoisie status, and so she leaves to the gym to achieve this status through training much like Ash's. But she has a much greater skill set than Ash does, so she achieves her status as a petty bourgeoisie by belittling Ash, telling him constantly to use his head to establish that her knowledge base, while imperfect, is much greater than Ash's. And thus, these two believe it is their destiny to become full members of the bourgeoisie, and they, because they do not have enough skill and fame to be fully accepted members of the bourgeoisie, yet they prove their superiority to the proletariat class by pu putting down Ash Ketchum. So as we have shown, no matter where characters fall within society, whether they're proletarian, petty bourgeoisie, or even bourgeoisie, no one is really satisfied with where they are within this society. So how attainable is destiny really? Will anybody ever be satisfied with where they are? Marxism portrays a world where society and ultimately happiness is controlled by one or two things. People within such a world view their destinies or dreams exclusively within that context, creating a stifling socioeconomic structure where people strive for positions that will never afford them contentment. However, the real world isn't necessarily so one-dimensional. It is faceted. Thus, while in Gatsby and in Pokemon, characters are dissatisfied because they never achieve a sort of epitome 
within the context of the American dream or individual destinies, in reality, people can find at least some satisfaction. That comes from being able to choose what facet you are on. I am not competitive at all. This was extremely obvious in the first few weeks of fake class this semester as I consistently remained in the same spot while running. Toward the back, but not quite last, and showed little to no care about this placement as long as I was running and not walking. This began to change, however, as I realized the sooner I finished running, the sooner I could get to the shower, and most importantly, get breakfast. When I had no time to get breakfast more than twice in one week because I was one of the last to make it to the showers, I decided it was officially time to pick up the pace. While I can run at a decent pace and can push myself to run with the fast girls who have remained the same since the beginning of the semester, my desire to run with them solely to make sure I can get the same highly sought after shower privileges makes me a member of the petty bourgeoisie in my fit class, similar to the way Nick is a petty bourgeoisie in Gatsby, as he associates with the bourgeoisie to partake in their privileges in the same way I run just to get to the showers first. Never quite last, never first, always somewhere in the middle. As many of you have experienced, I'm sure, there is a perceived status difference between regular and AP classes as the proletariat and the bourgeoisie of SJA academics. Personally, I felt that everything with my name on it had to meet a standard that would work in an AP class. That I had to prove that I belonged in that AP upper bracket, even if it's just an email to my theology partners, who really couldn't care less. But piecing together bourgeoisie perfection every second of every day came at a price. My mental and physical health. I was so physically uptight throughout high school, basically, that I developed tendonitis in every single muscle in my entire body. <laughs> and I was so mentally anxious that everything had to be just right, just the way it is, perfectionist, that I gave myself anxiety-induced old lady vertigo. But why was I doing it? Well, why did every party that Gatsby ever throw have to be immaculate? To prove that he belonged in the bourgeoisie bracket to prove that I belonged in my AP class. But as I'm coming to my senior year and I'm realizing that I can't do everything and not everything you do has to be perfect, I'm realizing that the AP standard is just a bunch of malarkey. You don't have to prove yourself. You're already here. You're already surviving in this AP class. And once more, you don't have to be the very best academically. You can find another facet. You just have to be the very best you that you can be. All right, so as a lot of you know, I am not suave or cool or smooth or anything of the sort. I don't feel the need to create extensive social networks. And I still probably don't know about one fifth of our senior class. And as a kid, this was an issue because in a world where friends and smoothness are commodified, I am definitely in the proletariat me. So as a kid, I was shunned for not reaching out to other people. I guess people assumed that I hated them, and so in their minds, they were returning the favor by bullying me. So I tried to fit in sometimes, but it ended up just being very exhausting, so I just learned to live with it. And so I came to high school thinking, people mature, right? No. I still have friends who are appalled because I don't fit their ideas of a properly social human being. I hear things still like, you're so antisocial. Ugh, oh, you must be so lonely. Did you and your boyfriend really just stay in and watch that movie again? Why don't you leave your house, Stormy? It's really not that hard. And the thing is, people try really hard to prove that they're not like me by putting me down like that. Like in Pokemon, whenever people would shove Ash to the ground or tell him that he was stupid or a loser for not knowing everything or not having the skill or fame that was the commodity of that society. But my answers to those questions are always the same. No, I'm not lonely at all, thanks for assuming. And yes, we did just stay in. That movie was great the 12th time around, you should really watch it. And I don't go out simply because I don't want to go out. 
So is it possible to be happy even in a society that sees you as a proletariat? Yeah, it is. Because I'm pretty all right with life. But why? It's because while people in one facet may view me as a proletariat, I can still pursue my destiny in another facet that allows me to be content with where I am. So as we've discussed before, Marxism is all about trying to reach the goal of bourgeoisie status. And for me, like many other girls, my idea of bourgeoisie status was having a figure like this. But unlike other girls, the desire for this figure, the desire for bourgeoisie status, led to an eating disorder. Um, this began in middle school. I was always really small, but somewhere in my mind, I just felt like I didn't fit in with the other small girls, the girls that had this type of figure. Um, and so because of this, I continued to strive for bourgeoisie status. Um, I wanted the popularity that came with it. I wanted the friends. I wanted the feeling that I was doing something right. Um, and this desire for bourgeoisie status continued into high school. It actually manifested itself physically in an eating disorder. I felt really guilty after eating, and so I just wouldn't eat. Um, and I hit all of it, so I would be purely bourgeoisie. I didn't want to be that annoying proletariat like Ash, um, who continued to try to be bourgeoisie but was never quite getting there. I wanted to be purely bourgeoisie. Um, and so after a while, I saw how slippery the slope was of maintaining this bourgeoisie status and how physically harming it was, how all-consuming it was. Um, and so I realized it might not be worth it. So I got help, and I got healthy. But I will never forget how intense that desire was, how much it controlled my life, and how all-consuming it really can be. Why do you always have to prove yourself? What is it that motivates you to surpass the achievements of others? Do you settle for the compartment that others place you in? What controls you? So we ask you again, are, are you satisfied? satisfied?